Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode three of Helium 10's Learning from Els with Lem. We're at episode three here, folks. I'm loving it. We're on a good streak right here, and I hope you guys are enjoying every second of it, because I am too. Now, as always, the goal of this show is to share some real stories about some common and not so common missteps that sellers have made on their Amazon journeys, and to ultimately learn from those whoops moments. So we're going to cover two to three stories and bring them back to life for you all to hear because mistakes can be our best teachers and they also make for some really great stories. So let's get started. Our first story of the day comes to us from a seller in North Carolina who didn't know how to effectively communicate the details of their product in order to mitigate the critical reviews that they were getting on their listing. Now, let's break that down. Let's get into the story. What does that all mean, right? So the seller in North Carolina, they are getting critical reviews due to customers not properly understanding the size of the product when purchasing it and then receiving it, right? That when they bought it, they thought it was going to be a lot bigger than what it was when they received it. So they were confused. They were like, this is a lot bigger than I thought, or this is a lot smaller or whatever. And typically you can see the technical details of a product within the product listing if you scroll down, but not a lot of customers look at it. And honestly, the font is really small and it tells you the po- package dimensions and it tells you that it's like 17 by six by five inches, right? But that's also a really small thing that often sellers will assume that customers are going to take the time to go ahead and look and scroll through the listing to ensure that the package dimensions are up to their own understanding of how large or small a product is. And so that was the first mistake that the seller made. They made a couple of mistakes, but they're all kind of like bashing together. But this is why we're telling this story so that you can learn from this as well. But it's real, honestly, True to God, it is a very common mistake to make. And so with the technical details, they're assuming that the customer is going to go ahead and read that. When in actuality, we need to make it more clear. So what the seller did when upon getting a bunch of reviews saying, hey, I thought this was bigger than I thought, I thought it was smaller than I thought, the seller's like, man, I knew that they should have been looking at the technical details, but they're not looking there. So maybe I'll put it in my bullet points. Goes ahead and puts in their bullet points to say, hey, the package dimensions are actually X by Y by Z, right? Three weeks later, still getting critical feedback. What is going on here? Now, it's not the end of the world if you get a negative uh, product review. It's not, you're gonna get them one way or another, but if we can prevent them, then like, of course, why wouldn't we, right? And so the seller is just racking their brain like, what is going on? How do I make this more clear, right? And so this goes into the second mistake is assuming, and I mean this in the best of way possible, right? Is assuming that customers read all the bullet points. Don't Now don't go running around saying, Lemp said customers are dumb. No, that's not what I said at all. All I'm trying to say is that they are visual learners and that you need to be very intentional with the details you're going to share, right? And so if you're trying to really Uh, be exclamatory with it's this size or don't put it in a dishwasher or these are the instructions you you, you're going to want to put it in a visual element and frankly speaking the bullet points just aren't enough so what the seller had to do finally after a few weeks of getting still more critical reviews on our listing is put it into their images i'm assuming you joined me in a round of applause because that is the right decision to do right put it in your images Put it in your A-plus content in a much more visual format because people are visual learners when it comes to Amazon listings. They buy with their eyes first and not necessarily in terms of reading. They look at what the product looks like, right? It's 100% guaranteed that when a person buys your product, or I guess 99%, let's not go too far. Let me go a little too crazy there. It's 99% guaranteed that when they look to buy your product, they're going to look at the images. That likelihood goes down a lot more when considering if they're going to look at your bullet points before they buy a product, right? So that's the biggest takeaway here. And that that's the biggest lesson the seller had to learn is that if there's something you really want to get straight across to your consumer or your customer to ensure that there's no confusion, to ensure that there's no issues when it comes to critical reviews about 
misconception of the product of what I thought I was buying versus what I received, make sure it's highlighted in clear terms within your images and within your A plus content. If you have that of, Hey, it's this dimensions. Hey, don't put a dishwasher or whatever it is. Feel free to throw in a graphic there and I guarantee you're going to see results. Our second story of the day comes to us from a seller from Mexico. Hold up. Helium 10, please cue salsa music. All right, cut the music, back to business. That launched a product without a proper USP, also known as a unique selling proposition. Now, what is that? I don't mean to put us back into school, but let's just go over some definitions real quick. USP, like I said, is known as a unique selling proposition, which according to the Cambridge Dictionary is a feature of a product that makes it different from and better than other similar products and that can be emphasized in ad advertisements for the product. Man, do I feel like a smart cookie now. Essentially, just a way to differentiate your product from the competition. Now, this may sound like common sense of Hey, when you launch a product, of course, you want to stand up from the competition. You want to make yourself different. You want to make yourself have a reason to for people to buy that product versus that versus other products. Right. So, like I said, it sounds like common sense, but it actually isn't. If you think about it like this, right, if you're a beginner, or you're just starting off and launching a product in private label. It's pretty common to look at a product and see, hey, this product is exactly this size. It does exactly this function. It looks like exactly this color and see the levels of success that they're doing and just assume that, hey, I can make a better listing than them, but I can just have the same product. I can have the exact same levels, levels of success, if not more, right? And even though it seems like on paper that's doable, the reality of it is that that's just not realistic. Customers are a little bit more smarter than that, that you're going to have to put in some effort to make sure that your product stands out and is different from the competition that you're competing against. Right. Even if it's minimal or even if it's a, maybe a different way you're marketing it or maybe you're looking at putting it into a different niche or something like that, there does have to be some form of differentiation for you to establish a valid USP so that way it makes sense for why you are entering the niche and why people should buy your product versus the other product, right? And that's the biggest mistake that the seller in Mexico did uh, is not considering that uh, factor when launching this product. But now let's get into, okay, how do I find ways to differentiate then? And don't worry, Kalem's got you. I'm feeling generous today. I'm feeling good. I'll give you three ways, three tools of how you can differentiate pro your product and it's not going to take us 12 minutes to get there. It will take us a minute and a half. So the first way is to look at your review insights. Look at the review insights of your competitors, which you can find within the Helium 10 Chrome extension. Good plug there. And look at the critical reviews only, meaning only look at the one, two, and three star reviews of that product. Look at probably four or five of your competitors and look to see what are some of the common phrases of what people say they don't like about the product. Maybe it's low quality, or maybe it's, I wish it had an extra shelf, or maybe it's, I wish it was two inches longer or whatever it is, whatever the common phrases or complaints are when people are writing critical reviews are, take that into consideration and see if you can improve upon those factors with your product. Number two, look into Magnet. Magnet is our amazing keyword research tool that allows you to find a ton of other relevant keywords just by putting in one main seed keyword into the search bar. So you can use Magnet to try to find unique long tail keywords that are relevant to the niche that you're considering that you might want to enter into and see if you can't make one like your main keyword, right? Like maybe you're looking to compete in notebooks, but you put in notebooks and magnet, you get a whole bunch of keywords and you see that there's one very specifically for notebooks for journaling anxiety, something like that. Maybe you want to create a notebook journal that's specifically for anxiety. That could give you an idea of, hey, you're still in the same niche of notebooks, but a good idea of how to stand out apart from the competition and to establish that USP. And third and last of all, 
use black box. I love black box, but specifically, and I guess you're not going to guess this, use the product targeting tab. Why? It's because when you use the product targeting tab, you can see what is most commonly being purchased along with your competitor's product within the same shopping cart. Meaning that if somebody's buying that notebook, they're also going to buy a pencil. They're also going to buy an eraser or whatever it is. And that's going to be showing up within that product targeting results within black box. There's definitely a potential bundling opportunity that you could capitalize on and stand out from the competition with that in mind. So be sure to check out those three ways to differentiate opportunities and to ensure that when you're considering launching a product, especially for private label, that you have a valid USP in mind. Every scandal has the one who heard it first, the one who lives for the drama, the one who is the least interested, the one left brokenhearted, the one who keeps secrets, the rake at the center of it all. Our third story of the day comes to us from a seller based out of Chicago. Shout out to Shy Town. And they are coming to us with a story about how they didn't realize that how easy it is to remove negative seller feedback. So negative seller feedback. A lot of people know what seller feedback is, but do we really know the difference between seller feedback and product reviews? Now, obviously one is for the seller, one is for the product, but what makes the difference really when it comes to the context of it and when it comes to how you can remove one or the other? Right? So a product review is specifically a review that's meant to be for your product, for the item itself of how it performs, its function, um, maybe if it stands up in terms of its quality, things of that nature. Now, seller feedback is meant to be feedback that's provided to you as a seller based on your ability to provide great customer service, your ability to fulfill that item effectively. So like it doesn't have a damaged box or any packaging or things of that nature. If you are doing it through FBA, then you don't need to worry about getting solid feedback based on fulfillment because Amazon's handling that for you. Um, but the biggest difference is here is that product reviews are really, really difficult to remove. Um, even if the customer is leaving it for the wrong reasons, or maybe it like doesn't make sense or it's confusing, it's really hard to get that removed because Amazon is very customer centric with, uh, with good reason, right? But they're very customer centric. So with seller feedback, you'd think they'd be the same, but no, it's actually not the same case. With seller feedback, more often than not, people will incorrectly leave product reviews within a seller feedback section. And so obviously that doesn't have nothing to do with how you are as a seller. It has nothing to do with your ability to operate your business on Amazon. So can we get that removed? Short answer, yes, it's really easy. Long answer is all you have to do is go to your seller feedback portion within your Amazon Seller Central, and then you're gonna scroll down and then see if any critical reviews you've gotten, whether it's like a three star or a one star or whatever it is, you can see that. And then if it has one of these three items, if it talks about the fulfillment of by Amazon, if you're using FBA, if it talks about the customer service by Amazon, or if it has personal or identifiable information, I guess I lied, it's four things. Or if it's the product review, then it is super easy of all you have to do is go to the right side of your screen, click on that drop down menu and click on request removal. And more often than not, and this is my favorite part, Amazon has an AI type of algorithm going on where it's able to detect it right away and take it out. It'll kind of redact it from your seller feedback and it's as if it doesn't even impact your seller feedback rating. And more often than not, that'll happen. Or they'll create automatically a case for you that will be sent to seller support for you to, to go ahead and complete that case. And it's, all you gotta do is submit it, follow up every once in a while, and more, more likely than not, get that piece of seller feedback removed. And so going back to that seller from Chicago, they realized that they had like a 70% seller feedback, but the majority of their seller feedback could have been easily removed you still are unable to get it removed because it's past a 90 day time frame. So the big takeaway there is to ensure that you are getting to your seller feedback in time to get rid of those ridiculous and nonsensical seller feedback portions. So that way you can make sure your seller feedback looks clean and pristine. And one way to do that without having to constantly 24 seven be looking at your seller feedback 
is to use Helium 10's alerts tool. It is perfect for doing that. It does so much more than seller feedback, but seller feedback is a great portion of what it covers of being able to track if there are any changes to your seller feedback or even for your products in terms of product reviews, product dimensions, category, the list goes on and on. So be sure to check out Helium 10 Alerts to get some help on that. And be, feel free to go ahead and check out your seller feedback and see if you can get some of those things removed and improve your seller feedback. Well, I'm sorry to say, but that concludes our stories for this episode. I know, I know you want to just keep on watching, but you can watch the other two episodes for another touch of the Learning from L's with Lem. Thank you so much for watching with us. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, subscribe, and click that notification bell. And if you have any stories of your own that you'd love for us to feature, don't worry, we'll keep you anonymous. You can go ahead and send it over to sellerstories at helium10.com. We'll see you next time.